She has a lengthy love affair with criminals. When she was attorney general in California, she refused to invoke the death penalty against cop killers. She allowed for individuals that continued to break the law to roam free. I mean, this is what we're gonna get under Kamala Harris. We're going to get rapist murderers, not only the illegal immigrants that are coming across our country, 11 million of them, we're going to also have a free for all in terms of criminals roaming our street. She has bailed out more criminals than I can count. And that's why there's such a sharp irony in what we're seeing come out of the Harris campaign right now. And so they are now trying to pretend like Kamala Harris, Tim Walls are people of faith when they have in no way demonstrated that over time. Um, you look at Kamala Harris and she is someone who has specifically targeted religious people. Welcome to the Sean Spicer Show on this fine Wednesday to you. We are just a few days away from the kickoff, the Democratic National Convention. A lot to get to there uh, in Chicago. More on that later. Um, I want to show you something that is so funny that we've talked about this call that this spaces that they call it on X, Twitter, whatever, between Elon Musk and Donald Trump. Literally now they're talking about billions of impressions, people actually seeing it the the number of people watching it is one thing. The number of people who have now seen it is unbelievable. But look at this. This is the White House press corps reaction, or, or not reaction, but this is a question that literally came up in the White House briefing room. I want to show it to you because you're not going to believe it. Elon Musk is slated to interview Donald Trump tomorrow tonight um, on, on X. Uh, I don't know if the president is going to tune in. Feel free to say if he is or not. Um, but I, I think that... Um, Misinformation on Twitter is not just a campaign issue. It's a you know it's an America issue. Uh, what role does the White House uh, or the president have in sort of stopping that or stopping the spread of that or um, sort of inter intervening in that? Some of that was about campaign misinformation, but you know it's, it's a wider thing, right? Yeah, no, and you've heard us talk about this many times from here about the responsibilities that social media uh, platforms have. <laughs> All right, all right, that's enough, that's enough. Normally, I would play the appetizer word salad that Corinne Jean-Pierre would be doing right now, because that's where I always get have the most fun. Uh, you like how I call that? That's the, Kamala Harris is the, the entree word salad. Corinne Jean-Pierre is the appetizer word salad. Normally, I'd contra contra uh, you know, focus on that. But stop for a moment and think about what just happened. A reporter who loves to probably wrap themselves in the First Amendment, in the freedom of press, just ask the White House what they were doing to stop a private conversation from existing. What are you doing to stop it, is what he said. Stop and think about this. And do you see any of the other reporters outraged about this? Nope. The press corps wants to stop a private conversation and wants to know what the government is going to do to suppress it. That's nuts. And no one cared. No one cared. Corinne Jean-Pierre's first response should have been nothing. This is America. We have a First Amendment. They have a right to do that. We may disagree with it, but they have a right to do it. That's what all you folks are supposed to care about. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Is that unbelievable? I know it got no play because why would the press report on that? They don't want you to know because all they care about is you hearing, reading, and seeing what they tell you. Kamala Harris, great, stands for what you believe in. Doesn't matter if that's against what she believes in two days ago. You can't have a private conversation, comrade. The government will interfere with that. This is insane. This reporter just asked what the government was doing to stop it, and no one cared. And this comes on the heels of the EU sending Musk a threatening letter saying, "You, how dare you have a... By the way, this is all before it happened. The reporter's asking that. The EU putting out a letter that Dan Crenshaw and others posted saying, if you have this conversation with Donald Trump, we may suppress you. We may fine you. We may ban you. We may outlaw you. How dare you have a conversation 
Where's the concern about democracy? Remember, we love democracy, except if you don't support us. All right, I, 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 so much more to get to. I wanna tell you, if you are the person in charge of your company or the person in charge of your finances, I'm gonna tell you about something completely game-changing. If you don't know about Ramp, you need to. Trust me, a previous guest on the show called me afterwards and said, I cannot believe I heard about Ramp. We're using it now. So if you have a handful of employees or more, you're going to want to want that. It's a corporate card. So you've got the one that you issue to your employees to let them you know, spend money on travel, hotels, company expenses, and an expense system all in one. And it is unbelievable. The people who use this talk about the level of efficiency, time saved, expenses. It completely allows you to automate so much of what happens in your country company and you can limit where people can spend money how much they can spend it it's completely real time it's easy to set up to get started um, they can issue virtual and physical cards and you can start making payments in less than 15 minutes and here's the kicker just for trying it just for contacting them you can get 250 dollars when you join ramp go to ramp.com slash spicer ramp.com slash spicer if you run a company if you're the finance person if you're the owner you need to check out ramp uh cards are issued by sutton bank and celtic bank members fdic terms and conditions apply all right we're about to go through two really interesting things today you heard yesterday robert kahaley talk about um about how to best get at Harris, to talk about her record, to talk about her policy, her positions, because most people in America who are going to decide this election aren't going to rallies. They're not watching cable news. So we need to get to them and talk to them about who Kamala is. I'm gonna have a conversation with Mahek Cook, who's a GOP strategist in just a little bit about how to do that in the most effective way. What is working to go against her? But then here's the thing. Today, today, the Harris campaign is launching Evangelicals for Harris. Stop laughing. It's not a joke. And all they have to do is be somewhat credible on this. If they get just a little more than Joe Biden I'm going to read you this in a second. But if they are successful in doing this, okay, we have a problem. And I'm just telling you this now because it is unbelievable. Megan Basham from The Daily Wire has a brand new book out called Shepherds for Sale. It details what's going on by the left trying to infiltrate everything that's going on in our movement. And I'm going to bring her in in just a minute. She is this, it is rising in the charts. The New York Times had to acknowledge it. That's how big this book is. You are going to be blown away by what's happening, how the left is infiltrating the evangelical community. And folks, just I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to read you the stats in just a minute. If they're even mildly successful at this effort, Trump could lose. That's why what I'm about to share with you in just a little bit is so critical. I'm going to start the conversation with Mahek Cook talking about how we should message against Harris. And then I'm going to get into it with Megan Basham from The Daily Wire about this brand new book that she has that details what's going on now. Let me kick it off with the heck. Before I do that, I want to tell you about my friends at Four Patriots because we have seen in politics so much go on that's unexpected. And just like this news and the political ups and downs are completely unexpected, so much can happen in our life that's unexpected. That's why I have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X in my house. Because if the unexpected happens, if the power goes out for a day, a week, a month, months, and that's possible with all the threats of attacks on our electrical grid, I will be ready. The Patriot Power Generator 2000X powers the most powerful things in your house, refrigerators, tablets, computers, TVs, medical devices. And because it comes power it powers off of solar panels that come free with it you don't have to worry about trips to the gas station whether or not it's open fumes noise this thing can be brought into your house it's portable so if it's not you that's in trouble a friend a family member you can bring it to them so go to fourpatriots.com slash spicer to get your patriot power generator 2000x so that in a time of emergency you are ready all right let me bring in the heck cook mac welcome back to the show good to see you thanks for having me sean you know I keep 
thinking about what our guest Robert Cahaley said to me. People who watch cable news are not the voters that we're going after. People who are attending Trump rallies or Harris rallies are not the voters that matter in this election, right? Most of these voters don't know anything about Kamala Harris. Uh, they live normal lives. They work hard. They're caring for them families. They're involved in activities, maybe working two jobs. And so while we mock this idea of her redefining herself and the media going all in for her, the reality is, is that for most voters, she's a clean slate. Look, Sean, I think you're right. And it's so important when we talk about Kamala Harris to continue talking about her policies. This was always the Biden-Harris administration. So when we're thinking about everyday voters, we have to talk about the economy. We have to talk about immigration. And we need to nail Kamala Harris every single time because she has yet to address the American people. We are a handful of days away from early voting. I think what some states are starting as early as early September, and we have yet to have her address the American people. And the truth is Kamala Harris doesn't know who she is, but we do. She has- do, 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 Wait, wait, do you know, she, she knows who she is, right? I mean, my point is, I think her view is I'll be whoever you want me to be. I mean, she's a shapeshifter. She's a foot flapper. That's, I mean, she'll be who you want her to be as long as you give her power. That's right. And that's why I say she doesn't know who she is. She's allowing the American people to dictate it. You want fracking today? I'm for fracking today. You want to close down the border? I'll be the best and best and best and biggest borders are. But the truth is she's had 1,303 days in office to ensure that voters can put food on their table. She was the deciding vote in a $1.9 trillion spending bill. As we can't afford groceries and gas and diapers, Kamala Harris is spending money and her hands are in our pockets. We talk about this Biden tax. I call it the Kamala Harris tax. Every single time you're spending, ask yourself, were you better off four years ago? This is her policy. And the other thing is, she is the border czar. If she wanted to seal that border, she would. She has allowed under her watch nearly a hundred illegal immigrants that are on a terror watch list. Sean, they're roaming the streets in America free under her watch because she has refused to allow the remain in Mexico policy, which allowed illegals to remain in Mexico until we vetted them. This is Kamala Harris. She's dangerous. She's extremely liberal. And we cannot afford four more years of her administration. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, despite the fact that she's been in an office for quite some time, she's getting this opportunity to quote, reinvent herself. Think about it. We've got her time as vice president, as you just brought up right? That's three and a half years, 1300 days in office, all these policies. Her time as a U.S. Senator, where she cast, I don't know how many hundreds, I guess, votes uh, on a variety of issues. And then her time in California as both a DA and an attorney general. So uh, it's not for lack, it's not like she, I mean, think about it. When Donald Trump ran, he was not a politician. He'd never run for office before. He'd never cast a vote. He had never signed a bill into law. And yet, he was attacked for everything. Here she is with this long record. And we're debating, I think, on our side about how to go after her when it seems to me a pretty obvious strategy. Well, we have to start talking about her record. And she has a lengthy love affair, I like to call it, with criminals. When she was attorney general in California, she refused to invoke the death penalty against cop killers. She allowed for individuals that continued to break the law to roam free. She endorsed Mandela Barnes. Somebody should look that up. He was the most extreme Senate candidate in Wisconsin who wanted to release Wisconsin inmates. Mandela Barnes, the lieutenant governor, is for defund the police. And, and now it seems like he's changing his tune now that it's a dead heat. Yeah, he's really changing his tune. He he used to say that uh, letting prisoners out was sexy. 
I mean, this is what we're going to get under Kamala Harris. We're going to get rapist murderers, not only the illegal immigrants that are coming across our country, 11 million of them. We're going to also have a free for all in terms of criminals roaming our street. She has bailed out more criminals than I can count with her counterpart, Waltz. Waltz refused, refused to make sure that there was funding as the George Floyd riots were going on. So these individuals were locked up for 10 seconds because Kamala Harris came in, started a fund that pushed these criminals back on the streets. We are not safe today. If you want safety and security for your kids and your families, you're not going to allow Kamala Harris to get away with this. She has a dangerous record from attorney general to senator to vice president. The fact that the American people aren't talking about this scares me, Sean. These are the dinner table conversations we need to have with our families. We're in a lot of trouble if she gets elected. I agree. We are. And that's the thing. I harken back to what you just said before that final piece, which is we have to do this. And it's the thing that I don't think that we've ever had to really do to the extent that we need to now, right? It is up to us if we don't have those conversations with our neighbors, our friends, and our coworkers, the media is not gonna do it for us, right? I mean, that's the key. I, I just, I feel like people keep thinking the cavalry is coming and it's not. No, Sean, we have to save ourselves. It is up to every single American. I don't care if you're red or you're blue today. I need you to start living in the green. And the green means what is in your bank account? Are you able to provide for your families? If you're not, you need to go back to President Trump's policies when we okay. drill. So, so I do this morning meeting with Mark Halpern every morning at nine o'clock, right? And yes. one of the people from Ohio challenged me the other morning and he said, I, I used to be a Republican. January 6th was the hill that I couldn't climb anymore, okay? And he said to me, cause I kept talking about the record and the policies. And he said, and this is what I want you to respond to. He said, I can't survive democracy being under attack, which is their line, uh, but I could survive four years of Kamala Harris bad policies. We as a country, can recover from that. And I said, I don't agree with that, obviously. How would you respond to that? Look, I think if this gentleman in Ohio is talking about democracy, let's truly talk about it. President Trump was nearly assassinated. How many days has it been since we know the facts about the shooter? the dereliction of Secret Service. Let's move on to the countless cases against President Trump, his family that have spanned the United States to take this man out of office, off of the ballot. Let voters decide. This is the lawfare that's happening under the Biden Kamala Harris administration. And this individual should also know it's not just President Trump. It's each and every one of us that's being targeted. School board members that are speaking out at schools to protect their families are now being targeted by the FBI. We're not going to survive this. We're not going to have two pennies to rub together, let alone the lawfare that's going to happen against every single individual that speaks out against this administration. It's already happening. There's an undercurrent in the DOJ and the FBI that is corrupt. We're not surviving today. We're not going to survive the next couple of years if we have a Harris administration. Yeah, not to mention the fact, I mean, what I brought up to him as well is you want to talk about democracy, let's go toe to toe. You guys are a party that just sent operatives to New York to get Robert F. Kennedy kicked off the ballot. The essence of democracy is being able to vote. And you guys have spent the last seven, eight months kicking people off the ballot, changing the dates of primaries to put the fix in, pushing out the sitting incumbent president. And you want to have a conversation about democracy? All right, let's go. I think that, I mean... But let, let's get back to, to, to Harris for a second. You brought up the crime issue. I think the border issue is important. I think the economic issue is important. If you had to have a 30 second elevator pitch, you come across somebody who's been living in a cave in Ohio and they say, Mahek, uh, I, I just got out of the cave. <laughs> I hear we pushed out Biden and we replaced her with Kamala Harris. I know nothing about her. Why should I vote for Trump versus Harris? You have 30 seconds, go. 
we must vote for President Trump because we had four years of peace and prosperity. We had safety. Today, we have over 11 million illegal immigrants crossing our country and every state is a border state. Women are being raped and murdered under Harris's administration. She was the border czar. She has continued to show a dereliction of duty. And then let's just talk about affordability. We cannot afford Kamala Harris anymore. If you want to feed your family of four, if you want to go on that vacation, if you want to succeed in life, and live that American dream, you're going to allow for capitalism and not for socialism because that's what Kamala Harris stands for. Well done, Mac. <laughs> all right, of, of all the issues, is there one that stands out to you that we should spend more time on than another, more that uh, an issue? I keep reminding people, it's not about, re if you're already with Donald Trump, you know, I always tell people when I used to work on campaigns, they'd say like, oh, I'm not sure I really like the ad. And I'm like, are you voting for us? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, then the ad's not for you. And sometimes we have to remember that if you're with Donald Trump, some of the tactics aren't about reinforcing why you're voting for him. It's to get the new ones. What, what do you think is the most effective uh, issue against Kamala Harris that will persuade people that are still on the fence? I truly think it's this immigration and border crisis. Yeah. Look, I think that everybody needs to know the second that Biden Harris came in, Harris sat there and said, we fundamentally altered and undid every single one of President Trump's secure the border policies. That should be a red flag to every single American to say, why are you undoing safety and security? That's the number one issue, Sean, because we will have another terror attack. Mark my words, it's only a matter of time. We had an assassination attempt. It's only gonna be a matter of time before we have a terror attack because people have forgotten 9-11. People have forgotten safety and security. And I'm a legal immigrant. I was born in India, made in America. And I believe the American dream is accessible. Why? Because of safety and security policies, because of securing the border, and then giving me and my family the tools to succeed. And we slogged hard in this country. We don't want handouts. But when you continue to leave an open border, to allow illegals, their first act is to break the law under Kamala Harris's watch, then you're going to get more destruction and death and chaos. How many more women have to be raped before we say enough is enough? This is the number one policy. This is what we need to be talking about every single day. We should be fearful for our families and children under Kamala Harris. Yeah, it's funny. I always talk about the, uh, the contrast between fear and safety, right? Which is what I think you're addressing there. And this idea of joy and hope, which is what they're trying to peddle. And I think that, you know, people are scared about the country and their families and their communities, and, and it's a bigger motivator. So Mac, I appreciate you joining us as always. Thanks for your insight and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. You bet. What a great conversation with her. As I mentioned, today was the launch of Evangelicals for Harris. I wanna play you the ad and bring in Megan Basham from The Daily Wire to talk about it. Megan, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the book. I mean, this thing has rocketed up the charts uh, in an amazing way. And I think it really speaks to what an important issue it is, but also the work that you've done to expose what's going on. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And it has, and I think it is because it confirmed what so many evangelicals, so many evangelical voters suspected was happening in their churches and ministries, but they didn't have the evidence for it. So now when they wonder why is my pastor insisting that we need to say oppose the Trump administration's border policies, but support the Biden administration's policies, they're starting to get an understanding of where that's coming from and what money and what influences are driving it. Well, I want to, I want to, get to a lot of that because I think it's, I mean, it's fascinating to me. And it's something that I've been wondering about for a while. And suddenly your book came out and I was like, this now makes so much sense. But talk about fortuitous. This morning, David Brody uh, put out a brand new ad that's coming out from uh, the Harris team on this. I want to play you what they're saying uh, about religion and how they're going at this. So let's take a look at the ad. Have you been to the cross and said, Lord, I have sinned, I'm sorry for my sin, I'm willing to change my way of life. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. 
I'm not sure I have. I just, I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. All right, so you can see it there. Evangelicals for Harris really trying to put this issue of forgiveness front and center, trying to make Donald Trump look like, or at least undermine his relationship with God. Um, what, what do you think they're trying to do here? Well, look, I'm not going to pretend that Donald Trump has evidenced any deep theological or doctrinal understanding. He, he's not a pastor, he's a politician. And so I, I find this particular commercial really telling coming from a, a campaign that is diametrically opposed to biblical morality in so many ways. But what it does show is how important they recognize that evangelical voting bloc is. So for those who may not be aware, evangelicals are roughly 30% of the electorate. Even left-leaning legacy outlets like The Atlantic have called them America's most powerful voting bloc. And there is some evidence that in 2020, the Evangelicals for Biden gambit, which kind of ran the same play, was somewhat successful at swinging not a lot of evangelical votes, but just enough in a couple of key swing states that it put Biden over that, let's say, um, margin of cheating or margin of rigging certain uh, early voting options. So when we look at that, um, we can see that they thought, okay, that was an important component of it, it gave Biden just enough votes in those states. So we need to run that play again. And it was key there that you saw Billy Graham because Billy Graham's granddaughter has been one of the people running point on this evangelicals for Harris. But what all of this um, stems from are secular left wing funders who have been driving policies like this into evangelical ministries. So if we look at evangelicals for Harris, I can tell you specifically Christianity Today's board chairman is on um, that Evangelicals for Harris team. He's speaking at an event. Now, that's something that Christianity Today probably wouldn't broadly want people to know because they purport to be biblical on matter matters of sexuality, gender, marriage, sanctity of life. And yet here's who they're partnering with. You dig a little deeper and you find that this is not unusual for Christianity Today. They take a lot of secular left-wing funding they have a lot of staffers who donate to Democrats, including their editorial and news staff. So this is par for the course of what is happening with this leftist infiltration into evangelical spaces and ministries. You hit on the word secular. I want to I want to bring that back up in a minute because I think you're putting your finger on something that I have been talking to friends about for a while, and I want to get your take on it. But I want to go back to the to the tweet that David Brody put out when he, when he issued this ad, because it touches on exactly what you're saying. It says this, this is not just a play for liberal Christians. The group already has over 200,000 evangelical Christians who have signed a pledge to volunteer and vote for the Harris Walls ticket. Big Zoom call tonight, FYI, that's later tonight. Uh, they ain't playing. Look, there's here's a reality check. This is Brody writing. Donald Trump will get a hefty majority of the conservative evangelical vote. That's a no-brainer. But if you think of an effort like this as laughable and a waste of time, you're missing the larger political point. Elections are typically won at the margins, especially in the seven key swing states. And so with that in mind, consider this. And this goes to your point. In 2008, Barack Obama received 26% of the white born-again evangelical vote and won. In 2016, Hillary Clinton received 16% of the born evangelical vote and lost. In 2020, Joe Biden received 24% of the white born-again evangelical vote and won. If Kamala Harris gets 20% or more of the white born-again evangelical vote, not out of the question, Trump will par probably lose. That's David Brody writing that. Do you agree with his assessment? Yeah, I do. I very much agree with his assessment. And more importantly, I know that the secular left funders of so many of these efforts also agree with it. And that's why they have been uh, really turning their uh, position in the last 10 years from opposing evangelical Christians to figuring out how they can co-opt them and even failing that, at least suppress that vote. So they don't necessarily have to get these voters to swing to Harris they can just get them to stay home because they are demoralized or they feel that there are no good choices here. And so that's also a part of this effort. And look, you've seen them do this not just on uh, these candidates, but also on specific policies. You have people like George Soros, 
who have funded groups like the Evangelical Immigration Table to oppose uh, Donald Trump's fairly reasonable board, uh, border policies and pretend that they are uh, extreme, beyond the pale, unbiblical. In one case, a high profile SBC leader, which is the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the US, tweeted out that they were wicked. Well, these efforts are actually being funded by secular left funders like George Soros. And that is what the people in the pews don't know. All they see is their leadership saying, this policy, this border policy, this remain in Mexico policy is wicked and evil. And they don't know that this pastor is actually involved with a secular left funded group to say these things. And so how does that relationship work? What did you uncover in, in, in writing this book? Like, is it that they get a call one day and says, hi, I'm George Soros or his affiliate. <laughs> I've got a bunch of cash, but I need you to say the following. Like, how does they, how do they infiltrate churches and denominations? Right. It's not quite that explicitly transactional, but it's not far off. So what we saw, for example, when we look at immigration, one of the most important issues to voters is that uh, a secular group called the National Immigration Forum that was funded largely by Soros when it found, was founded and now by a number of other secular left funders as well, they formed a front group, the Evangelical Immigration Table. Legally, there was no separation between these two entities. It was under the umbrella of the secular left National Immigration Forum. And then what they did is they bring in a host of recognized and trusted evangelical institutions like Christianity Today, like the National Association of Evangelicals, which represents some 45,000 churches in dozens of denominations. And these entities are trusted because in the past they were conservative. For example, the National Association of Evangelicals hosted Ronald Reagan in 1983, and that is where he gave his famous evil empire speech. So that is why so many people tend to trust them because they don't know that these um, institutions have drifted far left over time and they are now taking money from people that none of these evangelicals in the pews would agree with if they knew about it. So what they do then is they fund these efforts, um, they hire pastors, they hire leadership to run these organizations who are also working with groups like the National Association of Evangelicals. And then they put out these talking points. They write letters to lawmakers, to GOP lawmakers in the name of evangelicals saying, we want you to back uh, Biden's border policy. We want the Biden administration to turn over and shut down Donald Trump's remain in Mexico policy, even though it was very popular with the evangelical base. So these things are done in their name. I want to get back to this idea of secularism, because mm -hmm. as I said, it's been something that I've been talking about with friends of mine for at least three or four years now. And the reason I want, I want to get your take on this is that what amazed me is the left in terms of our society and culture hijack stuff where I want to identify as this. And so you must uh, use my pronouns to recognize me or whatever. I, I, I'm sure I'm butchering some of their, their talking points here. But if you're religious and you say, I am a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm an evangelical, and I believe the following, then instead of you having to recognize or accept me, it's okay for you to demonize me. That this idea of, of, of not allowing someone to basically practice their religion, even acknowledge it. Like I can't, I, I, I couldn't you know, say you know, respectfully as a Catholic, I don't acknowledge that, or the Bible teaches us this, to now would be offensive, hate speech. And, and so they have pushed out the ability of people to discuss or practice or acknowledge their own religion. No, that's absolutely true. And that's why there's such a sharp irony in what we're seeing come out of the Harris campaign right now. We have specifically seen them um, suppress Catholic uh, news organizations that people like David Delayden that were trying to get out um, important reporting on what was going on with Planned Parenthood and the traffic in uh, aborted fetal tissue and organs. And so they are now trying to pretend like Kamala Harris, Tim Walls are people of faith when they have in no way demonstrated that over time. Um, you look at Kamala Harris and she is someone who has specifically targeted religious people. You look at Tim Walls and there's nothing in his record that demonstrates a holistic Christian understanding of ethics when it comes to so many issues that are so important to Christians. 
And yet you see the media just now, this wasn't something they were trying to do before the election, trying to play this game of repainting them as suddenly religious in some significant way. Uh, just this week, I saw numerous uh, secular media outlets referring to Tim Walz as a Minnesota Lutheran. Well, that's very ridiculous. We've never really seen any evidence that Tim Walz is particularly involved in even his very uh, liberal mainline faith. And Kamala Harris has never spoken with any sincerity about her Christian faith. And yet that's what they're doing. They're trying to take these people who have for so long targeted Christians and now say they're one of us in order to try to secure those votes. But what you know is that as soon as the election is over, if they are successful, they will go right back to targeting Christians and trying to force them to act against their uh, religious impulses and against their religious consciences. Yeah. Were you shocked at the opening of the Olympics when they had that scene that was clearly a mockery of the Last Supper? And I thought to myself, I always tell people when I was at the RNC as the spokesman for six years, when little Timmy at Thomas Jefferson Middle School said something offensive, they'd be like, Timmy's dad's a Democrat, so you must respond to Timmy and da da da. I mean, like we had to respond to everything, no matter how ridiculous it was, if there was some association with some kid uh, doing something somewhere that was a Republican, we, uh, we were accountable for it. And yet the media that loves to paint Joe Biden as a devout Catholic, despite the fact that he's very publicly against many of the teachings of the Catholic faith, was never asked about this mockery of the Last Supper, something that his wife was the U.S. emissary to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I found the whole thing unbelievable, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Every time I say I can't believe it, people look at me and go, were you really that surprised? Like, I can't believe that it was so painted over and brushed aside that if this had been any other group that was afflicted or concerned, but the effect that they went after Christians and mocked something just so essential to our faith and no one was held accountable for it. NBC didn't do a story that today, show, I mean, NBC, you would think that for all the outrage that they cover, that that would have been something, but nope, complete whitewash. Well, you know, it's funny in, in the abstract, you're maybe not surprised because this is the kind of thing we've been seeing for some time. We can look at the Dodgers just uh, last year, if you remember during Pride Month, and that really abhorrent um, group that they welcomed for their Pride celebration that had a Jesus on a stripper pole and drag queen strippers really sort of demonically cavorting around him is all I can say when you saw that video is what it looked like. So those sort of things, when you think of them now in the abstract, aren't surprising. But as a Christian, when you see it, of course, it, it assaults your mind, your senses to see your savior depicted in that way. And I think that's a natural response. And we're not going to see the media ask the Biden or the Harris uh, administrations if they approve of that, if that's something they find offensive. And in part, what you need to know is that some of these um, bought pastors that I'm talking about, those who have been bought either because they're involved with these secular left funded institutions or they're just looking for adulation from the secular left media they are actually giving cover i don't know if you saw but there were quite a number of them that immediately rushed out to suggest well christians shouldn't get offended by this um yes we love our lord but we are not taught in scripture to be offended for uh mm -hmm. this you know uh, these blasphemous depictions of jesus christ which then I want to know, well, what Bible are you reading? Because zeal is actually something that's fairly encouraged all throughout scripture, that we are to care about God's name and how the world treats it. So uh, we're not to fight for our own reputations, but we are to fight for his reputation. And so uh, that was part of what was maybe the most astonishing part of that story to me was the number of pastors who I saw run out to almost try to excuse it and to caution people not to react. Yeah. So if I'm attending a congregation right now and my pastor is saying things about open porous border trans acceptance whatever and i'm starting to think hey this is uh veering a little left what what should i be doing what questions should i be asking how do i find out if this infiltration as you have in the book is happening where i'm at you know attending services well, I mean, the first thing is to do a little homework. I can give you one pretty stark example that's occurring right now 
the editor in chief of Christianity Today, Russell Moore, and New York Times columnist David French uh, put together a political Bible study that is rolling out to conservative. We're not talking about you know mainline liberal churches, conservative churches. It was promoted by the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, which represents 185 Christian schools, uh, including conservative schools like Biola and Azusa. They were encouraging their campuses to bring this uh, political Bible study, this curriculum onto their campuses for their pastoral ministry courses. And what it's teaching is that Christians don't need to vote uh, to protect the sanctity of human life, but they do need to vote to uh, address alleged systemic racism. So it's subtle, but it's very clear who they're wanting you to vote for. And what you need to know is that curriculum like that, watch for it, it's called the after party, was exclusively funded by secular left funders, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation, who also back abortion and transgender treatments on kids. So the first thing you need to do is a little bit of homework whenever you see that kind of curriculum coming in. And then you need to, don't overreact, don't immedi immediately blast your pastor, but I would ask him, hey, can you explain to me where this is coming from? Can I take you to coffee? Right. Um, can you just help me understand why we're getting involved in what are very debatable political issues, like what our border policy should be or uh, whether we need climate change legislation where the Bible doesn't speak, because that seems to me like a pretty standard uh, biblical definition of legalism. So I want to understand why we're doing this. And so I would do that. I would ask some questions. But look, if it's clear that your pastor is tangled up with some of these groups and is unrepentant, at that point, I would say it's probably time to start looking for another church. Right. But also, isn't there like an IRS component? They're not supposed to be political. And it's funny because everyone on the conservative side gets so wheezy. Oh, I got to be careful. I got to be careful. And the left is going full at it. Like they don't have a problem. The left is like, all right, we're going to tell you that, you know, open borders are cool and hair spot. Maybe they're just doing it better. But I always feel like the right gets so squeamish when it talks about preaching from the pulpit and the left is like, hey, we're going to have at it. One, I think that's true, unquestionably. But also they're a little bit careful to like this after party curriculum to not make it about candidates. They make it about issues. And in that way, they tend to try to circumvent some of those 501c3 regulations. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and I, as somebody who has published four books and found it interesting what outlets will have you on to promote or not. I mean, I had one prominent bookstore in DC politics and prose when I put out my first book that was like literally would not allow me to appear there. And this, they're not the only place. And I just, you know, it's interesting. And you yeah. write in this, I have received cease and desist threats from one of the country's most powerful law firms. My publisher has received letters from major ministries asking for meetings about their concerns. Backroom power brokers have tried to discredit and derail my project. And yet, I mean, I think it's a credit to you. I mean, this thing just has gunned up the bestseller list. But what? how hard has this effort been for you? Uh, it's been difficult. Uh, all of those things you just read, that's happened. It's been ongoing. I can say that targeted attacks have continued on this book. I have continually had to come out again and again and present the evidence publicly to try to refute false claims from pastors who are trying to say, uh, I didn't say that, or you know, a major leader of the Southern Baptist Convention who was former president, a guy named J.D. Greer saying, well, I didn't say that. And then you have to come out and just repeat again and again, look, here are the records, here are the citations, here's what you said. Um, and I know there have been backroom efforts to suppress me. Uh, some friends have been calling and saying, here's who's asking me to retract my endorsement. Um, and so that, on top of that, of course, the cease and desist letters have continued to come. And to HarperCollins' credit, they have not backed down from that. And Really? I'm surprised. I was. I thought those guys would fold like a cheap suit. No, nope, no. Nope. They've stood behind me all the way, and I'm incredibly grateful. And uh, I mean, I can tell you that I, uh, I was surprised that the New York Times list recognized us because, of course, they say they're an editorial list, uh, and they don't always recognize conservative book sales. But I think the reality is the sales for this book were so big that they couldn't plausibly ignore it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like I said, I was shocked. Uh, and, and again, it's a great read. It's not that it's just you've done some amazing work exposing the what's happening. But man, the lengths and I wasn't even like touching the third rail like you are. But I've just seen the tip of some of the suppression that exists and knowing what you've been through and yet 
succeeding the way you have, I mean, that just speaks to the level of interest there is in this book and the demand that people have for wanting to understand what's really going on. So, I mean, I, like I said, kudos to you because I have seen a fraction of this, but I have not had the cease and desist letters or any of the kind of stuff that you've had. Um, and, and I just, it, I think again, this goes to show what I try to talk to people all the time about is that like corporate America is against, it's not just, it's, mm-hmm. it, they're trying to secularize what's going on in religion, but they're trying to, you know, make sure that we don't actually get alternative thought in this country. Yeah. And look, this is part of that long march through the institutions that we have seen from the left. They have taken our entertainment culture. They've taken academia. They obviously tend to run the beltway. And now what we're seeing is this attempt to sort of take what I describe as the last fortress, the church, because evangelical Christians, just by virtue of their great number and their theologically and politically conservative outlook, they are the firewall that is holding back a great number of terrible leftist policies. And so that's why you're seeing this all out effort to infiltrate them, because if they fall, that's kind of ball game. Megan Basham, the book, Shepherds for Sale. Congratulations on the success. Thanks for sharing it with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Remember, it's so important. If you know someone that can join us for the premiere every night, 6 p.m. Eastern, that's a huge help for us. As you're watching the show, please text people. Say, hey, join Sean right now. Check out who the guests are. That is so helpful to the cause. I appreciate all of your support as we come up on the one year anniversary of the show. Continue to subscribe, hit that notification button. We'll see you back here tomorrow. We've got a great panel discussion in store as we get ready for the Democratic National Convention and the reinvention of Kamala Harris. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe and click the notification bell to get more.